But what I want to um, do today is to tell you a little bit about the type of work that we do. Um, I'm a neuroscientist, and we study rats, which may not seem entirely relevant. Um, but I would point out that they say that in London, at any moment, you're never more than a few feet from a rat. <laughs> and in fact, our conscious city is mainly full of rat consciousness. So what I want to do is to explain how studying the rat has um, enabled us to understand how our brains comprehend space. And I, I believe quite strongly that our, our comprehension of space really informs how we feel about the space that we're in and whether we feel comfortable in the space and whether we engage with it. So I believe it's critically important to understand how we understand our space, and hopefully I can convince you of that. So there are various aspects to understanding space. There's been quite a lot of work over the last several decades to show that we have an internal map which I'm not going to talk so much about today. Today I'm going to talk about the internal compass that we also have. So um, we all have what we colloquially know as a sense of direction. We have the sense that we know which way we came in, for example, or which way the toilets are, or you know, which way the exit is or something. So wherever we are, we feel we have some kind of orientation. It may not be well linked to the outside world, but we have some type of orientation nevertheless. And as a neuroscientist, I've been quite interested in how the brain actually does this. How does it make a compass? So the way we do this is to study single neurons. So the brain is made of millions of neurons, billions of neurons, in fact. And these neurons are talking to each other in some kind of language that we're trying to understand. And to understand that language, we need to be able to listen to what the cells are saying and then try and decode the language, if you like. So this is a typical kind of experiment. This is where I have to kind of wave my hands a bit. So um, we, we study rats, and what we do is we implant into the brain of the rat a, a tiny little electrode, no, no thicker than a hair. Um, and the rats live with these things for months and months. They don't feel them or anything like that because there's no pain receptors in the brain. But they have these little implants. And in fact, some humans have these as well. So, um, but most of us don't, although one day maybe we will. Who knows? Um, <laughs> So when we want to listen to these neurons, what we do is we connect the little implant on the rat to a recording system of some sort at a computer. And the action potentials, the little nerve impulses produced by the neurons that are near the electrode, get detected. So here is a blown up picture of a, of a rat brain. It's not as wrinkled as the human brain, but in other respects, it's almost exactly the same. So uh, we have all the same bits in our brains. Um, so there'll be a little electrode going into some part of the brain, and it'll be listening to one of these tiny little neurons. So the, uh, the size of this is about the thickness of a human hair. These things are really, really tiny. But they're producing nerve impulses, um, and we can collect these little impulses with a computer, and we can feed them out through a loudspeaker and listen to them, or we can feed them into some kind of analysis software. And what I want to do um, here is to let you listen to what we listen to when we're doing one of these experiments. So um, what you're going to see is a rat. He's just walking around in a box foraging for food. So the experiment is scattered rice or something. He's not having to think. He's not having to navigate. He's not having to be aware of which direction he's facing. And what you will hear coming out of the speakers are the impulses from one single neuron in his brain as he's walking around. like a machine gun. So did you notice anything about those nerve impulses? Anybody? They weren't there all the time, were they? Any, any kind of thoughts as to what was making that neuron fire? Mm, possibly. Um, watch again. Quiet, quiet. Suddenly active. Active, active, quiet. Active again. Active again. So it's only when he faces in one particular direction. It's only when he faces down towards this corner of the box was that neuron active. So if you take all of those action potentials and work out the firing rate and then plot that as a function of which direction he was looking, 
then you find something very much like this. So this is a typical example of um, what we call a polar plot. So this neuron was firing when the rat looked to the southwest, let's say, um, of that room. So this was a head direction cell. And we now know that these head direction cells are found in a network of regions in the brain. So they were discovered by these two people here. James Ronk was the very first person who ever encountered one. It was very, very exciting. And then Jeff Tauby was a student of his at the time. And he's unraveled this whole network of brain areas. So that's the type of experiment that we do. And the question, one of the big questions in my lab is how does that neuron know which way the rat is facing? And we can use that neuron's activity as a readout for what the rat thinks is going on in the world. Where does the rat think he's facing? How does he know which direction he's facing? So there's a little compass in the brain. There's also a map, and there's also an odometer, and there's all sorts of other things. And I'm mainly going to focus on the map. And we've learned a few things from this. So one of the things that we've learned about is that when animals or people navigate from one place to another, usually what they're doing in terms of their calculation is working out a vector. So they're working out the distance and, and direction from where they are now to where they want to go. And here is a, um, an example. Again, it's an animal example, but we're exactly the same. This is a, this is a really nice example of a vector. So this is um, our hen. Um, it was a couple of years ago now, and we forgot to collect eggs for a while, and she built up a few of them and, and flipped into the state that hens go into called being broody. So she now thinks it's time to hatch those eggs, even though they're not fertile. And she really wants to be in her nest box, sitting on these eggs, but I've taken her out of her next nest box. And she is pointing her head back towards the eggs. That's where she wants to be. And if you look at her head, just look at how... Oh, sorry. Uh, why is this not playing? Oh. oh, that's a shame. The video has not come through. Okay, sorry. I had a really nice demonstration of a homing vector where you move the hen around and her head stays absolutely pointed to the next box, nest box. So she has an extremely good sense of direction. And it's able to compensate for movements. So one of the things that we've learned by studying head direction cells is that even though subjects move around... The brain is able to take information about the movements and compensate for those movements really quickly. So even if you do it with your eyes closed so that you can't see anything, you can still maintain a very good sense of direction. So these head direction neurons are integrating information from different sources, movements, landmarks, um, all sorts of things. So they're very, very multimodal. Humans maintain active homing vectors. So... Um, even though you're not very familiar with this room, most of you, you have a vector to the door. If somebody suddenly shouted fire, you'd be out of here like a flash. You don't even need to think about it. So we're constantly maintaining vectors to various important places. And one of the important places is the doorway in which you came in. So that's something that people need to be aware of when they're designing for people, is that we have these escape vectors. And they're not... Uh, logically thought through. They're not susceptible to signposts or anything like that. They're in our heads. They're very, very instinctive. If you suddenly panic, you run. You don't follow the fire exit sign. You run back to the doorway. So we need to kind of understand how our instinctive navigational computations are conducted before we um, design for people. The uh, second thing that's come out from studying the head direction system in animals, which we know now is also true for humans, is that the head direction needs visual asymmetry. Um, and here is a really nice example of this. I think this is going to work because I've got a little uh, arrow on here. So this is one of the most famous moments in American uh, football sporting history. So it's quite a... Stops, throws, completes it to Kilmer up at the 30-yard line. Kilmer driving for the first down, loses the football... It's picked up by Jim Marshall, who's running the wrong way. Marshall is running the wrong way. And he's running it into the end zone the wrong way. Thinks he scored a touchdown. He has scored a safety. It makes me laugh every time. And, he, and, and to put the seal on it, because he was so sure he'd reached his home side, he then threw the ball out in victory, which, which netted the other team two more points or something. So that was a really, really, that was a very, very embarrassing. He never lived that down. He went on, he had a really illustrious career, but he was always most famous for that. So what went wrong? So what went wrong was that a football stadium has um, twofold rotational symmetry. It looks the same one way as it does the other way. So if you're standing in it, it's 
kind of hard to work out which way you're facing. So what do I mean by rotational symmetry? So here is something that has threefold rotational symmetry. You can take that pattern and you can rotate it by 120 degrees and it looks exactly the same. You can rotate it by another 120 degrees and it still looks exactly the same. So um, every third of a rotation, uh, it maps onto itself. A lot of environments have twofold rotational symmetry. So the football pitch, for example, you can rotate it. So what happened to him was that for a moment, he lost orientation. So although the brain normally compensates for movements, if you get distracted and you're moving and you fail to compensate, you then have to call upon the visual landmarks to reinstate your sense of direction. And because the visual landmarks, in this case, had twofold symmetry, he just kind of picked up the wrong direction. And he was very, very confident, but very confidently wrong. So we study phenomena like this in the laboratory. I haven't got time to describe the experiments, but we can get the same mistakes in rats. And we're now trying to correlate that with what the head direction cells do and to understand um, how these sources of information interact. Um, but we need to kind of take this type of thing in mind when we're designing for humans. So a lot of our built environments are rotationally symmetrical. Architects seem to love symmetry. <laughs> and unfortunately, they, well, they also seem to love rotational symmetry. So um, although it's very, very pleasing to look at, it can be very devastating for the head direction system. On the other hand, mirror symmetry is fine. The head direction system is not confused by mirror symmetry. So this is the British Museum. Um, it, it has a sort of a rotational symmetry, but the symmetry is broken by, um, I can't, yeah, by the, the, the way the staircases are. So um, although you walk into that space, you always know which way round you are in that space. So that was a really good example of using symmetry breaking um, while combining with the, with the pleasingness of that visual symmetry. I, I love that space. Um, another thing that we've learned is that in order to have a sense of place, you need to have a sense of direction. So it's possible to be in a place that's very, very full of landmarks and very, very full of visual information and all the other things, signs and everything else that humans love. But if you haven't got a sense of direction, you can be very confused. Um, and here is a classic example of that. This is an example of designed confusion. Um, this, is, uh, this is IKEA. And what they do is they design their stores, so I understand, um, in order to be maximally confusing to your sense of direction so that you have to wander around aimlessly. <laughs> and meanwhile, they present you with all this kind of stuff. Um, and and you know, in, in, because they've foiled your sense of direction, it's very difficult to plan shortcuts through the space because you never quite know where you are. And so you end up just following the guided path and then you pass all of their products. And apparently, people buy more that way. Um, I think probably also their galvanic skin response must massively increase. So without a sense of direction, we become quite uncomfortable. Um, and places without directional cues are very, very common, particularly large spaces. Conference centers are, are famous for being disorienting. Um, airport terminals, the same. This one has you know, two-fold rotational symmetry and so on. Um, Piccadilly Circus, rotational symmetry, really a nightmare. So, um, so yeah, symmetry is a problem. The other thing that we found out is that the head direction system prefers to use landmarks that are far away. So it prefers to use things that don't move around as you move around. Something like a mountain range um, is very orienting. So I grew up in New Zealand, where, um, it, which is very volcanic, and there are lots and lots of hills and mountains. And you're always well oriented in a city because you can always see which way around you are. Things you can walk around may be very prominent. You would think they would be useful for landmarks, but they're not very good for the head direction system. Um, things that may be visually distinctive, nevertheless, head direction system doesn't care about them. You can logically d distinguish these two things, but your head direction system kind of regards them as the same. These were used as landmarks in a conference <laughs> center, the, the, the one that I hate most in the world, the Washington, D.C. Convention Center. Signposts also, the head direction system does not, is not wired up to the verbal processing system. So you can give all the signposts you like. Your head direction system doesn't really care very much. Um, and then finally, um, the thing that we've learned from studying rats is that the head direction signal gets established immediately, um, and it's local. So the moment you emerge into a space, your head direction system goes, OK, need to orient myself. Right, I'm going to do that. If you provide information immediately, that's fine. 
then people can use that information and use it and have a, a directional orientation that's logical and consistent with the other spaces. If you don't provide them with that information, the brain will find something. And if that something is not consistent with the room that you're just in or the room that you're about to go into, then you're going to be confused. And so um, we need to bear in mind when designing for people that we need to give them immediate directional information, not when they've walked two minutes down the concourse to the exit or wherever. Um, and it's local. Okay, so uh, my time's up, so I'm just going to skip to the end and leave you um, with the, um, sort of the take-home message, really, that, um, that the head direction system has taught us all of these things that we need as designers to take into account if we want people to, um, to kind of understand their space. Uh, and then finally, I just want to make the point that, nevertheless, it's not the only thing that we're operating on. There's more than one navigation system in the brain. Um, and people will switch from one to the other. This is for an, an, another talk, not today. Um, but we need to kind of understand what system people are using in which situation in order to give them the best information. So I'm going to leave it there, and thank you for your attention.